the community and being human track. So feel free to be human. Get my slides going here. All right, so yes, like Laura said, I'm Shawnee Felger. I am the Digital Communications and Technology Strategist over at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, I have about 15 years of web development, design, and uh, UX experience, um, but uh, eight years in Drupal, Drupal 7 and 8, working with the CDC, uh, several units of the Smithsonian, and uh, the Department of Education, and of course, the Federal Trade Commission. So today, let's share how the principles of some of my top three favorite best-selling books can improve our work with Drupal. And then I'm also hoping to encourage you to kind of explore the self-help and motivation, uh, the business management, business uh, goals, and time management genres, uh, just as tools to improve your work-life balance. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, maybe we can talk a little bit about why self-help. Um, I'll discuss a little bit about how I got into reading so much self-help and, of course, uh, a little bit about myself and my roles in Drupal and why I thought this would be a good presentation. But then we'll talk about applying those uh, self-help principles from those three books uh, to our work. And then I'm hoping to hear from you, thoughts or any questions that you have this afternoon. So why self-help? Well, I thought my good friend Samuel L. Jackson could help me illustrate some of the many roles I've played in Drupal projects in my experience working with Drupal. Let's see, I have been a designer, I've been site builder, fun stuff, I've been tech support, so hold on to your butts on that one. I've been a trainer, accessibility expert, I have been the hold up man, if your site's not accessible, then we're not publishing. I've been a content manager. I've also been the user experience expert where I've just come in and said, hey, are users going to be able to use this? What about your user? I've been the project manager, but I, I'd say what I'm most known as in my own Drupal circles and kind of in my work and um, just my teams and the people I've worked with, I am most known as a front end developer or a themer. I think just like Sam Jackson is most known as Jules Winfield. So really, who do we have in the audience? What do you guys do? Or what are your roles in Drupal? What are the positions that you play? You can, I guess you can answer in the chat, huh, Laura? All of the above, right? <laughs> Designer, cool. Very cool, yes, it's a wonder. We are all so dynamic, right? Good job, everyone, all of the above. We do what we, have to do to get Drupal done. Very cool. So really for me, content, yeah. I found that each role has just required me to do, you know, some things outside of my comfort zone, uh, choosing options, making decisions, saying yes when maybe I didn't really want to, you know, maybe I was project manager and I didn't have, I had no idea I'd be getting into content management, but I had to do what I had to do to get the site going. Um, also saying no when I didn't want to or when I was afraid to, putting up my limitations and making sure that the work I was working on, I went hard on. So many, many roles require those sorts of different facets and angles of um, just life skills in general. Very cool, product owner. Yeah, a little bit of everything, same here. So. Say, let's click through. So, in doing all of these different roles, it's a funny thing. I've sat and thought about well, I've been a player here, I've been a player there, I've been this user, I've been this admin, I've been this, you know, publisher, editor, uh, just speaking in Drupal roles in general. But how many Drupal books have I actually read? Well, one. Uh, many, many years ago, I read The Definitive Guide to Drupal 7. I did not read it to from cover to cover. I don't know if anyone has read it cover to cover. Very, very good book, but it is the only book, actual tangible book that I have read regarding Drupal. Now, don't get me wrong. I have read hundreds, maybe even thousands of uh, issue pages on drupal.org, 
guides, blog posts. I've uh, looked at YouTube videos on how to do different things in Drupal. Uh, then I go into the comments. I don't know if you guys do this, but I read the comments to see if anyone else has anything to say about what the trainer is saying in the video um, or, or see if I can get another angle on what's being taught in the video. I've been on forums. Let's see, I've looked at conference slides, just like these ones right here. Um, project documentation notes. I've looked at my coworkers notes. I've looked at my own posted notes that I've seen to place everywhere. I have one on my monitor right now, just kind of helping me to get through Drupal. But what brought this presentation on is given that I've read just the one Drupal book, let's see, let's take a look at the self-help books I've looked at. Well, many, many self-help books. Self-help books are a lot of fun to read. Not only do you feel inspired, but it's also just really interesting to see how different people, you know, just go about their life day to day. Um, are you guys uh, familiar with any of these titles? Anyone in the chat heard of, that's not how we do it here, or who moved my cheese? Or how about the year of less? Susie Orman, Young, Fabulous, and Broke. Yes, the life-changing magic of tidying up. That's a good one. Yes, the what to expect books. If you're having children cover to cover on what to expect in the first year. <laughs> yeah, Think and Grow Rich, that's a classic one. Absolutely. The Profit, another classic one that it seems those principles can apply forever. Good. I'm glad to know that you guys have seen or at least heard of some of these and read them too. Mm -hmm. Seven habits. Absolutely. So there's, and there's many, many more out there. There's a self-help book for, I'd say anything at this point. So for me, I read self-help just to kind of help myself get organized. Um, I think self-help reduces stress. It uh, encourages you to get things done. Um, you can learn new approaches to life's problems. Um, some people don't feel as though they're goal-oriented. Well, there's self-help for that. There's books that'll teach you how to set goals and to achieve them. Um, with self-help, like I was saying, you can become more efficient at anything you're interested in from cooking to you know, making friends, just, just about anything. Um, and so it's very, very broad very, very popular category. Um, how about breaking negative habits or overcoming negative feelings? Say, you know, you're not ready to talk to someone, but you want to pick up a book. Self-help, they've got a book for that. Um, confronting personal fears, like public speaking, <laughs> or in general, just trying to become a better person, a spouse, better spouse, better parent, or a better friend. And, and self-help, and the reason why I wanted to talk about it today is because I think it really does help people. And hopefully, you know, you guys will get some sort of inspiration or just something out of this presentation that'll help you. So today we are gonna explore three bestsellers, the life-changing magic of tidying up. So I'm glad to see that you guys have heard of that one. Girls Stop Apologizing by Rachel Hollis, and then Essentialism by Greg McCown. The principles in these three books, they've just inspired me to just better manage my closet, better manage my schedule, my life, my kid. And then I, I find that it also helps me better manage my work. Let's start with the life-changing magic of tidying up here. So the life-changing magic of tidying up is very, very popular in the Zen spirituality and the home organization categories. I'd say it's number one in both right now on Amazon. Um, the life-changing magic tidying up, it helps readers to uh, declutter their homes. Um, and Marie Kondo, the author, uh, kind of trademark a method called the KonMari method. That's a very, very strict two item criteria that helps you to declutter your homes, your offices, declutter your desk at work um, and so what she does is she says discard first and then store throw everything away especially paperwork and then ask yourself does this spark joy don't store anything don't keep anything in your life that doesn't spark joy she was named one of times the most 100 most influential people 
And I really think she had a, a book, Spark Joy, and she's had a couple of other books, um, recently a business book about decluttering uh, your office life. But uh, I really think my, the magic of tidying up is what got her on that Times 100 most influential list. So how can we apply discard first, then store, or ask yourself if this sparks joy to our Drupal work? Well, applying Kanmari, discarding first, she says, Dispose of anything, throw anything away that is not currently in use, it's not needed for a limited a, a period of time, or it has to be kept indefinitely. So to me, that means I needed to take a look at some of my Git repos. Uh, does anyone push to get maybe unused files or maybe even executables or build files that you know you're not gonna need for production, but they get swept up in your push anyway? That happens, happens to me often. Um, I've seen, I've done it and I've seen team members do it. And what happens is you get confused as to which files you're going to need, what things you need to pull down. And one thing my husband was saying in his work, people are pushing rebuild files that then all have to auto regenerate his React files or other files that he didn't need to be auto generated. So you might be wasting time. So clean up your Git repo, repos. Get that stuff out of Git that doesn't belong in production, and then make sure your branches are labeled properly. Help your team, help yourself, help your team. <laughs> Another thing that I see very, very often, and I'm very, very guilty of doing, is multiple versions of files. Does anyone have anything like this on their site if you go to your Drupal backend and look at your files list? The same files, organization charts, um, documents that come out iteratively throughout the year for several, several weeks, and you have many, many versions of just the same file, Drupal's not a storage space for your files. At least I would say you, you don't want it to be. Right here, this is an org chart that belongs to an organization whose site is a subsite of a Drupal site. Drupal is not meant to store their files. So not only do they have a copy of their files, I have a copy of their files, and our Drupal site has a copy of their files. According to Marie Kondo, discard it. It's not needed anymore. The organization chart from October 4th, 2017 is not being, it's not published on Drupal, nor is it being linked to. Those are the types of things that she's talking about, discard, and that's what I'm saying to do on your Drupal site. Another thing in Drupal, take a look at your users, your nodes, your content types. Uh, what else do we have? Our vocabularies. Um, our views, maybe you've been building something new and you've tried lots of trial and error with your taxonomies, your vac vocabularies or your views, and you're leaving things in there that your team members are wondering, is this something I should be working on as well? Is this something I should be using for my project? If not, get it out of there. Do not allow your Drupal site to become a mess because in fact, you're discouraging your team from trusting your organization skills but also it just causes confusion and confusion in general. So if we move on with uh, from discard first, we've got to think about uh, sparking joy. So the second part of KonMari or Marie Kondo's method is keep things that spark joy. So everything you keep at your home, in your projects, on your desk should have a properly labeled home. If there's a proper home for digital content, say it's got file directories, Kondo's theory is that you won't have to tidy again. You won't have to figure out where a file goes or you won't stick it in the parent directory because it already has a properly labeled home. And that'll help keep things tidy. Her idea is that things will remain tidy forever. Now we're creatures of habit. You know, it takes time to break those types of habits, but She's saying, create those homes, create those spaces specifically for those categories of things. And from there, it should stay. Another thing, run rules and filters on your inbox. So guilty of this. Matter of fact, this is one of my inboxes. Those are all new emails, guys. I have got, to, I just didn't read them. <laughs> I have got to run rules or filters on my inbox, especially with things that no longer spark joy, uh, belonging to, um, listservs that no longer serve me, belonging to uh, organizations that I'm no longer a participant in, get off of those inbox and get off of those listservs and clean out your inbox or at least run rules on them 
to keep your inbox clean. Anyone else guilty of this? You can just put a Y in the chat box. Please don't let it just be me. I sign up for everything. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> yes. Got to clean out that email. Yep. Lastly, finding better apps, IDEs, code editors that your work will flourish on. I don't know about you, but I've been stuck with programs that I know in another position or at work, I enjoyed much better. Everyone has their own personal preference when it comes to their code editors, sometimes even with their email clients. If you're using something that doesn't spark joy, promote what you like, encourage your team, your organization, your leadership, your tech support to look into some of the IDEs or the apps that really help you get your work out of the door that you enjoy using and that you enjoy coming to work and opening up on a daily basis. I'd say that. So, so, so in doing these things, you're going to be making time for work that it makes you happy and, it, and you'll be engaged in opportunities that do pique your interest. You clean out your inbox, you'll start to see the things that you do actually like because you haven't thrown them away. And so that's kind of Marie Kondo's theory. Keeping things that spark joy allow you to throw away things that don't apply to you anymore and you start to learn a little bit more about yourself. So let's move on to girl, stop apologizing. So funny title, good title, but this book is not just for women. Girl, Stop Apologizing is basically a plan for embracing and achieving your goals. Uh, its top categories are business motivation, women in business, and self-improvement or self-help. So what Rachel Hollis does in this book is she aims to help readers achieve their goals unapologetically uh, with three actions. And we're actually gonna cover one um, part of these three. So first she says, let go of excuses that have you stuck. Um, make sure you're adopting behaviors that, you know, kind of get you um, started, get you building a foundation for success. And then you got to acquire some skills necessary for growth. We're all talented. We're all but born and blessed to be, to have some sort of skill, but there are other skills you've got to learn, baby. So Hollis, she's a CEO. She's a host, a podcast host, mom of four, sought after motivational speaker. And honestly, her books are really, really fun to read. So let's start with one excuse. She says that uh, probably has us stuck, which is I don't have enough time. Yeah, that's a pretty big one. We've got so much going on. I don't know about you, but even during the pandemic, during quarantine, I still feel like I don't have enough time to cover everything. So what does Hollis say? She says, trade in your comfort and reconfigure your schedule. Make a timeline of your week for starters. Find five hours, she calls them the five to, thrive, five to strive, in your schedule. And those five hours are the, are, are the opportunities for you to work on that goal or work on that thing that you wanna get accomplished, that you feel like you don't have enough time for. Use your best hours. If you're more creative in the morning or you, you know, you you're a night owl and you get real work done at night, make those hours your time to accomplish that goal and plan your schedule weekly. If you're in a quarantine home, like all of us are, especially if you have children, things come up a week to week to week nowadays. Stick to those five hours. And then of course, you gotta say no. It's one of the hardest things we can do, especially those of us who are multi-hyphenates on our projects. There come times that you have got to say no in order to keep those five hours for you to accomplish those goals. So that's, that's her point in saying, if you don't have enough time, she combats that with this kind of program. So a behavior to adopt, she talks about choose one dream and go all in. She trademarked 10, 10, one, which means 10 years, 10 dreams, one goal. So what's that mean? 10 years, who do you want to be? Who is the very best version of yourself in 10 years? And then think of 10 dreams to get you there. Dream big, be specific, 10 dreams that can get you to who you wanna be in 10 years. And then you start with one goal or one of those dreams at a time. So in Drupal, I'm thinking, what would we want our projects to be in 10 weeks or months or 10 years? Um, let's think of 10 features or pages or functions to get us there. And then think of one specific measurable goal to start. This might come down to your sprint planning. 
you know, think of the goal that you think of what your site or your project should be at the end of a sprint, at the end of an actual epic, at the end of the very end of the project. And then think of the 10 things, keep it down, keep it trimmed down to 10 and then work on one that'll get you there. Well, how do we start with that one goal? That's going to be a skill to adopt according to Rachel Hollis, which is planning. She says, use the roadmap strategy. So start at the finish line. This is going to be that one goal that's going to get you to those 10 things. And that's going to get you to who you want to be or what you want your project to be in a finite amount of time or 10 years. Brainstorm everything you can that'll get you closer to that end goal. Write it down, jot it down, talk about it, scramble it, get everything you can on paper and think about how you can get to the very end. But then step back a little bit. Extract three guideposts. These are what you need to do and action. They're an action that absolutely gets you to the finish line. Extract only three out of that big brainstorm soup that you have and then think about those as absolutes that'll get you to that end goal. And then list all your mile markers. So kind of like a roadmap, list your mile markers, which are how you'll get to the next guidepost. List those one guidepost at a time. I don't know about y'all, but I am thinking, okay, my goal is to clean the kitchen, which I'm looking at right now, which means I gotta do everything. <laughs> Rachel Hollis is saying, no, don't do that. You want a clean kitchen? Think of three things that'll get you there and all the little hows in between until you finally get to that clean kitchen. And don't think it's gonna happen in a day. She talks about doing 10 years. I say, hey, some projects are 10 weeks, some are 10 months, but same analogy. Work with the time, a limited amount of time and spell out a roadmap. So now you have a guide to achieving your goal from start to finish. So yep, create roadmaps for your D7 or D8 migration. I know we're all going through D7 and D8, moving on to D9. Uh, sprint planning, like I said, say you're incorporating the USWDS theme onto your site. Start, plan out a roadmap for getting that theme onto your site. Or say you're building a new site in general. Maybe think about a roadmap strategy to incorporate into your project plan on how to get that new site launched in a finite amount of time. All right, lastly, let's cover essentialism. So essentialism has four parts. I covered a lot in the slides with this one because it's such an interesting book. Many, many, many facts, figures, many, many ta tech tasks and techniques to do in order to become an essentialist. But let's see, I hope to have trimmed it down a little bit for you guys and applied it to our work in Drupal to make it make sense. So essentialism, has anyone ever heard of this book? I actually heard of it listening to one of Rachel Hollis's podcasts. Any yeses in the chat on essentialism or maybe ends for no's? Cool, love it, yeah. Lots of no's, okay. So this will be an introduction. Great. Well, essentialism is top tier number one in the time management genre on Amazon. It's also top spot in business decision making and a few other business and time management um, categories. So the thing about essentialism, though, is it doesn't teach you to finish everything in less time. What it, what the point of essentialism is to teach you how to do the right things, how to discern what is absolutely essential and doing the right things in whatever time it takes, but you focused on what's right. There are four parts to the book. Um, the essence of an essentialist, exploring yourself, eliminating things that are just non-essential, and then executing the process and making sure that you're still able to be, be an essentialist in all avenues of life. So Greg McCown, he's a renowned public speaker. He's worked with Apple, Google, Facebook, Twitter, working with organizations, departments, and small businesses, helping them to trim down their bottom line and make sure that they're an essential, essentialist business. So first, let's start with the essence, the essence or the core mindset of an essentialist. Well, non-essentialist, me right here, thinks almost everything is essential, views opportunities as equal. Non-essentialists are busy, but they're not productive. 
they often think, or we often think, I should say, we often think I have to do this. And we might even say yes without even thinking about what we're saying yes to. Non-essentialists take on way too much. They feel very, very overwhelmed. Whereas you might have an essentialist on the other hand, on the same team who chooses very, very carefully to do great work. Have you ever had a teammate who says no to a lot of things and then they turn around and what they are working on, it just excels? They could be an essentialist. They could be very, very choosy, very selective about what they're working on and making sure that they're making the highest contribution to what they are saying yes to. Uh, essentialists, they say, I choose to. They live by design, not by default. They don't fall into things that, um, that it, with essentialists, things don't happen to them. Essentialists make things happen for themselves. Essentialists also consider trade-offs. Uh, what can I go big on can, you know, for non-essentialists equates to, well, what am I giving up? Essentialists, they don't do it all they end up creating the outcome that they want. So that's the core mindset of an essentialist. So in Drupal, we're gonna be prioritizing the tasks that are essential to our work so that we can make the highest contribution with joy. So all of us who are multi-hyphenates, we're designers, we're project managers, we're the site builder and now we're the content manager. We're doing a little module development on the side as we work on a the theme. Um, what Greg McCown is saying is, Make sure you're prioritizing what is essential to your work, what is essential to your primary role in order to make the highest contribution. So sometimes you may have to say, I can't work on this right now because what I'm set to do or what I'm good at or what I can best deliver is still on my plate. So explore. So how do we discern the trivial many, all those little tasks that we said yes to, we didn't even think about what we were saying yes to, from the vital few? Well, you've got to create some space, some space, you've got to become unavailable. And Greg McCown says you've got to play. So maybe you might find something fun to do, problem solving, um, baseball games, uh, shooting hoops, whatever you have to do to get your mind away from work and figure out who you are. You can learn about yourself through play. You can learn about yourself through taking your annual leave, <laughs> becoming unavailable and finding that uninterrupted focus. Essentialists also select with extreme criteria. They ask themselves, is, ex is this exactly what I'm looking for? Um, Non-essentialists will use broad criteria to make decisions. Do I have time for this? Versus, is this exactly what I'm looking for despite how much time you have? Essentialists turn down good options for the perfect option. It takes practice. Also being selective, you're not gonna be the most popular one in the agency, but you will earn respect as you know who you are. It allows you to excel in what you choose. So in Drupal, you've got to escape to find some uninterrupted focus. Tinker with some things that you find fun. Maybe you are working in project management, but you wanna play around with the US web design system theme. Tinker with it. Find new ways to, to learn a little bit more about yourself. And then if you are a product lead, choose your projects, your clients, and your teams wisely. Make sure you're asking yourself, is this exactly what I'm looking for? So how can we cut out the trivial many? We've thought about, well, we know the core mindset. We know how to step away from work, have some fun, figure out who we are. Well, essentialists know is a regular part of their vocabulary. They think about subtracting things as making things better. If you've ever worked with someone, you've done a beautiful theme or a beautiful project and they start pulling out things that they find or deem unnecessary, that's an essentialist mindset. Or maybe you've worked with a project manager or you've worked with a client rather who wants to add so much more to the project that hadn't been planned for ahead of time. That could be a non-essentialist, someone who wants to pull it all in and you may end up getting overwhelmed by adding instead of subtracting. And then an essentialist, one thing I found really interesting is they find boundaries limiting. So with boundaries, as a non-essentialist, we're thinking, well, limits are limiting. They're gonna stop us from being able to do many, many more things from having greater reach. Well, non-essentialist is the mindset is, don't rob people of their problems. 
people will tend to inadvertently lay their problems, their tasks, or their roles on you. And if you didn't set that boundary, you're starting to take on work that you are no longer, you're either not good at, or you hadn't planned to do, or you might resent. You set a boundary. Hey, this is what I do here. Or maybe even you express, this will do, or this is what I'm interested in. People will not encroach on your time or on your space so that you can excel, go home happy doing what you had planned to do. One analogy Greg McCown talks about that I found really, really interesting and so true is how, say maybe you have a playground set near a street. That playground will have grown-ups, teachers, and parental guardians watching over the children playing, making sure that they don't go near that street. Now imagine a fence has been constructed around the playground, around maybe the schoolyard that blocks the street from the playground or blocks the kids from the street. Those kids are able to go anywhere within that fence, even to spaces that they didn't realize they could have access to because now there's a boundary there that keeps them out of danger. That's the type of fence or the type of boundary that allows you to explore further within instead of having to keep yourself so close and tight to your work or to whatever task that you're working on and you don't realize that you can go further as long as you're clear on how far you're going to go. I found that really interesting. And so then lastly, how do we even execute essentialism? How can we make doing the vital few things almost effortless? Well, essentialists, they start early and they start small in order to get big results. They practice extreme and early preparation. They look for the stakeholders that might show up. They are fully present in the current where you might have a non-essentialist who thinks about what was important yesterday or what was important tomorrow. Non-essentialist, we react to crises. Something comes up, we're handling it right away. Where an essentialist mindset is, you're do, you, you've already prepared for this. You've already realized that this could come up. You've considered it. So in Drupal, you're gonna wanna budget for the unexpected. You're gonna wanna seek out those surprise stakeholders. Maybe even form a group of folks who can identify other stakeholders who might creep up later on in your project you didn't realize had such an influence on. Um, you're gonna wanna communicate your blockers and address them fast. Get over that fear that you might seem incapable or that you might seem, uh, uh, have, or you might seem to have poor time management. You communicate your blockers just as we're all human, address them quickly so you can move on to the things that you wanna do. Now <laughs> that we've covered those three books, there are, of course, self-help pitfalls. Um, and, and this is all in the self-help region, of course. So you might find that one of the pitfalls is continuing to read ideas that disappoint you. You're in the middle of a self-help or a self-improvement book, and it just doesn't make sense. You're not even interested in pursuing this methodology. What does Marie Kondo say? She says, spark joy. Don't continue anything that doesn't spark joy in your life. Keep the things in your life that sparks joy. Another pitfall, trying way too many methods at once. You guys saw my self-help collage. Yes, I've read some of those at the same time. Big mistake. <laughs> what does Rachel Hollis say? One goal at a time. So maybe it's one book at a time. Maybe you discover some new things in a book and you start practicing or working with them. See if they apply to yourself or your life. And if they don't, or maybe they do move on to something new, see what else is out there. Trying too many things at once can get way too overwhelming. Another pitfall I've fallen into is following ideas that work for others, but maybe not for yourself. Well, what did McCown say? He says, separate the trivial many from the vital few. Make sure you're looking for things that apply to you. Um, they're like, there's so much information out there. It's self-help. The self-help genre is almost like the internet. There's so many things out there that just may not apply to you. So it's really going to be up to you as I encourage you to get into self-help or apply self-help to your work to figure out what really works for you. And so I also had some questions for you guys. Um, this is our last slide. And of course, if you have any questions, like Laura said, um, shoot them in the chat there. But I'm just wondering, how has the pandemic affected your own goals or your organization skills or your productivity? 
or have you actually found self-help helpful in your work life or how do you use your own uh, favorite self-help books uh, in your, in your uh, personal life? And then do you recommend any other books uh, that the audience uh, might be interested in that could have an impact on the way you work? And that's going to be it for self-help tips for your Drupal site. So um, it doesn't look like we have any questions, but okay. we still have about 10 minutes left in case we do. Um, and I don't see anything in the Slack channel uh, from the YouTube live folks. Okay. So questions, questions, Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, there's a question from Max here. Um, mm -hmm. For those, uh, for sorry, uh, for those of seeing those books all as all looking very interesting, but also overwhelmed by all the by the thought of reading them, any suggestions to pick one to start with? And feel free to unmike, uh, unmute yourself, Max, in case I totally butchered that. <laughs> Great question, Max. Um... Actually, I'd really say, think about the things that you're interested in improving. Um, for me, um, I started with, if I can, if you guys don't mind, I'll go back to my slide there of my kind of my collage. <laughs> so funny enough, I actually started with the little book in red down here called The Sisters Rules. Um, because I was interested in improving my dating skills. So this was way, way back. I'm happily married now. Um, my husband is listening in. But this was way, way back, um, close to my teenage years. I picked up this book in a little bookstore um, with my grandmother, because I know my parents wouldn't let me buy it. And uh, I just found it so fascinating that there's actually different types of rules you could apply to becoming a better dater. Um, so really it's about what is it that you might want to improve in your life and uh, start small. You know, say you want to work on getting out of debt, the Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover is a great book for that. Um, getting what you came for, say you're interested in going to grad school. There's many, many self-help books on going to grad school and um, making sure that you're, you're there for what you want to be there for. Um, and then, of course, if you want to stop, start with more of a philosophical approach of uh, The Prophet by Khalil Gibran, very, very classic book. That one does address a lot of areas of life from work to friendships to children to happiness. Um, it's a great book to start. And it just maybe each category or each chapter is maybe three or four pages, if that, of uh, just good advice. So. I hope that helps, Max. I, actually, I probably would say The Prophet is probably a very, very classic self-help book. Cool. So I see some comments agreeing and that sort of thing. So if there are no other questions, I actually have a question for you. Sure. So how do you balance Marie Kondo in your Drupal site when you have uh, crazy uh, records retention policies? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, absolutely. So, so it's funny. It's, it's one of those things that you never, it's, I'm going to sound so patriotic you just never stop fighting. <laughs> you stand your ground with some things and um, in a way you almost allow people to see how standing behind, you know, cleaning up your files, um, making sure that there is a retention policy in place in the agency, talking to the records management office, um, and being very clear and being very passionate about it, um, especially if you're coming from the tech field. I find that working um, like we do in federal government, not everybody is interested in maintaining or keeping a Drupal site clean. They want to see their work up on, on blah, blah, blah.gov, and then they want to move on. Well, it's really up to you to encourage um, removing some of those things maybe you don't even mention tidying up yet because <laughs> it's such a controversial book but it's up to you as the professional to encourage those types of things and make sure that you're protecting that property that drupal property does that answer your question Laura? it does uh so uh this was a very very cool talk um oh, thank you are, 
are there, it doesn't seem like we have any more questions. So All right. uh, without further to do, sorry, I just saw a comment in there. Uh, without further ado, thank you and have a great rest of your afternoon. Okay, and happy Thursday. Thanks for listening, everyone. Great to have you.